Good morning, good morning, good morning again. Happy New Year again. Man, it's so good to see um, all of you all here. Um, well, I'm excited to share and kick off this new sermon series in our first Sunday back. Uh, so if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to meet me in uh, Matthew chapter number 14, and we will get there uh, in just a moment. Uh, before we do, let me just take a moment and just pray for us, if you don't mind. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we come before you again, just thanking you for brand new mercies. We just sang about your faithfulness, which is unending. And there is no prerequisite for your faithfulness and the mercies that we receive. You're just good and you just do what you do. And we're so unworthy of your faithfulness and how you love us unconditionally. And so we humble ourselves before you, thanking you that you brought us through 2022. Uh, some stuff we want to leave behind, some stuff we want to carry forward. But most importantly, what we need is for you to go before us. And so, God, we ask that you would just um, speak to us today. I decrease so that you may increase. Uh, lead us in the way that you would have us to go. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name, amen. I have a very, very good friend by the name of Jason DeMeo. Jason is a real renaissance man. Um, and I'm, I'm just so happy that God brought us together and I'm, I'm friends with him. I'm learning a lot from him. Jason actually vocationally used to be um, a pastor. He's now a consultant and he is um, an artist. And I marvel now at how he's turned himself into this phenomenal artist. He's a painter and he paints um, these phenomenal paintings. And on the screen here, you will see uh, some of um, Jason's work. I mean, this guy is just, he's a legitimate artist now and He's in galleries. He's doing pop-up shows. Uh, he even has some high-end collectors who has some of his stuff now. And so I asked him recently, I, I said, Jason, you know, with no real training, um, with, with, you didn't go to school for this. Uh, how did you become this, this budding artist? And he told me two things. He said, well, first of all, uh, it came or it comes from this passion within me. There, there's something in me that's compelling me. I have this deep desire to create. And then he, he says, secondly, um, I actually have audacity. Like, like this, this thing that, that is in me, I actually have the audis, audacity to just try it. And he said, anyone who produces anything of note needs to have audacity. And he said, so many people say they want to, or they will, and they just don't. And he said, I knew I couldn't afford to buy these expensive canvases, but what I did know was that I could make a square, and I could try to make my own, and so I started there. And I share this story and this example with you this opening sermon series, this opening Sunday for us in 2023, I share this with you because we have this, this sermon series that we're kicking off called One Small Step, One Giant Leap. And it's a series about how small things, usually decisions and sometimes disciplines, lead to big things. This is big for us because in Zechariah 4.10, it says, don't despise the day of small beginnings. And I like the second part that says, because God rejoices when the work begins. So God rejoices when there is a step that we take. But you know what we do? Y'all know exactly what we do. We despise small beginnings. We do the exact opposite. 
right? Because we're looking for this finished product or we're, we're hoping to get to, to what we envision in our mind. But before we get to what we envision in our mind, it takes small steps. And so the Bible is clear to us that we shouldn't despise that, that actually God rejoices when we decide to take a small step. And so we've crossed over into a new year. It's 2023, and y'all know what that means. We got big goals. We got resolutions. We got hopes. We got all sorts of things that we're looking to accomplish and experience. But my question is, what do our small steps look like? These things that we envision, these hopes and these dreams, these desires, do we, do we have these small steps kind of, you know, written out and scripted? And the other question I have is, from what, where, or whom are we taking our cue? Who or what is guiding us as we take these steps? This is very significant as well, particularly for those of us who follow Jesus. Because if we desire to prosper in the manner in which God intends, well, he's given us Jesus as the examples. And then we have the scriptures that are the blueprint and the guiding principles for us. But it's hard to follow Jesus if our focus and our passion isn't pointed towards him. And many of the reasons why we don't fully experience God and what he has for us is because of lack of focus. Now, um, I love research, and so um, I just saw this, this thing recently, and, and this is probably not going to be anything that you wouldn't know, uh, per se, but the Virginia Institute of, um, Virginia Tech Institute of Transportation said that 80% of crashes happen because, why? We're distracted. Or inattention, they said. And most of us know that because most of us do that. But, but, but here's the thing. We also need to understand that the number one method that our adversary, the devil, the enemy, Satan, whatever you want to call him, the number one method that he uses against us is distraction. And we live in a world full of excellent distractions. It's called marketing. And this marketing just, it compels us, it, it stirs us towards some desire or some need, tying up our time, tying up our money, tying up our space. And the question that I have for us today is, what would it look like if we brought our stirrings, our, these things that are, are swirling in us, if we brought them to Jesus? And, and what would one small step look like, and how would it impact our lives? This, this, there's, there's a powerful example um, that we're going to unpack in Matthew uh, number 14, through the life of Peter. Peter, one of my favorite disciples, because Peter is a little gangster, y'all. Peter, he's always popping off, you know. Peter, he's, he's got a lot of enthusiasm. He got a lot of stuff going on. So I can kind of relate to Peter because he, you know, sometimes he, he's good. Sometimes he's a little off. You know, he, he, I think he reflects like the real followers of Jesus, right, because we all don't have it all together. But, but Peter, like my friend Jason, has a lot of passion, and he's got a lot of audacity. And there's something interesting that happens in Matthew 14 as a result of a small thing that Peter does. And so we're going to pick this up in Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. The first word says immediately. And so um, just so you know a little bit of context, this is right after Jesus has performed this miraculous miracle of feeding over 5,000 people, or well, men it says, so it's, it's, it's probably three times that because they didn't count the women and children. So it says he, he fed these thousands and thousands of people with just um, two pieces of fish and a, a loaf of bread. So they just experienced this, and then Jesus is, is sending them ahead. So it says immediately... Jesus made the disciples get into the boat out there, just performed this miracle, and said, go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because of the wind, uh, because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went up, uh, went out to them, 
walking on the lake. This is where it gets scary, y'all. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. What I want to talk about for the next few moments as we kick off 2023 together as a, as a faith community is just two words. Just ask. Just ask. There, there are many fascinating things that we can point out in this little sequence that, that happens. Obviously, Jesus walking on water, that's different, right? Just a little. It's dark. Um, the, the research tells us that it's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. And the boat is being tossed by waves, so it's windy. I don't know if it's really a storm or not, but nevertheless, the waters are choppy. It's not smooth. It's, it's tossing the boat. There's a lot of stuff going on. And the disciples are thinking, like, yo, this is a ghost. I'm out of here. And then Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's me. And Peter's response which was him just asking a simple question, is what has me perplexed. Like, sometimes I think we're so familiar with the scriptures or, or we're familiar with some of these stories, and we're not asking ourselves certain questions, right? So, so Peter asked this weird question at a weird time in a weird circumstance, right? Because it would be normal to see that and run. It would be normal to see that and to, to take cover, right? Which may have happened with some of the other disciples. And even once they're comforted by Jesus, Peter's response is actually opposite of what our biology and our psychology would, would do, right? Because when we're comforted, our biological and psychological response is to relax, not to take a risk. So Jesus comforts them, hey, it is I, at that moment, I'm like, whew, thank you, Jesus. Let me take a seat. Not the way in which Peter responds. And Peter shows us a small little thing about asking that I want to highlight for us. If you're taking notes, just, just one main point today. Asking Jesus is the small thing that leads to big things. And I just want to unpack that for us. Let, let's, let's examine what happens here between Peter and Jesus because, because he asked Jesus, he says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. There are lots of things I can say about this, but I, I don't think that this would be um, my response. Why not, Lord, is that really you? Yeah, it's me. Whew, okay, like, come on, get in this boat. Let me help you. Let me, let, me, let me help you get in this boat with us, right? But it's clear to me that Peter is compelled, watch this, to be where Jesus is currently. That's his desire, and it's deep within him. And Peter experiences this extraordinary moment because he asked to be where Jesus is. Every day we're compelled to ask and seek for what our hearts desire, but are we asking to be where Jesus is? Jesus, wherever you are, bid me to come. That's not really our normal questioning and asking. And this compelling that we um, feel is, is stirred on by the excellent marketing that I mentioned earlier that we have seen, like, uh, how about Sprite, obey your thirst? So whatever you thirsting for, hopefully it's Sprite, you need to obey that. That can get you in trouble, right? How about Uber, move the way you want, right? Oh, that sounds good, with Mar but when we apply that to our regular lives, that can get us in trouble, right? Or what about Burger King, have it your way, 
right? You can get it whatever way you want. We're going to keep moving on that one, right? How about Nike, just do it? Again, that sounds good, but sometimes we need to not do it, right? Now, I'm not hating on these companies. I'm not hating on marketing. Like, all of that stuff is excellent. It's, it's done well. But, but it's really compelling us to act on our, on our internal or our natural desires, right? But when we follow Jesus and our heart's desire is him, it changes our palate. It changes what we desire and what we want. We, we want and we ask for different things. It would be no different than, like, you know what? I changed my lifestyle, so I don't eat those things anymore. I don't pursue those things anymore because I have a different palate. Hey, maybe every now and then you still have the desire at moments, but your palate has shifted. And Peter is not asking Jesus to call him on the water with him if he doesn't have a desire for him and he doesn't have relationship with him. He's not asking to get out of the boat when it's, when it's not calm, when the wind is tossing the boat, everybody's around. He's not asking this question if he hasn't experienced something different with Jesus. Now, keep in mind, the context here is that he, he's, he's seen Jesus' radical teachings. He's, he's been following him. He's picked up on a lot of things. He, he knows that, there, that there's some extraordinary things happening here. He just saw a, a miracle of thousands of people being fed with just a little bit. And so I'm sure that this is factoring into his mind. And so as I, as I process this, I'm, I'm asking myself the question, well, I mean, what if I started asking like Peter asked? Lord, if it's you, tell me to leap. If it's you, tell me to move. If it's you, tell me to walk over there. If it's you, Lord, compel me to go. Now, I do a version of that sometimes. Lord, if it's you, help me. You know, it, it, it ain't a little, it ain't as convincing, you know. But, but what, what would it look like? Like, what, what, how would we experience God differently if we asked in that way. Did you know that there are, this was just, just a quick peruse. I didn't do like a, a, a big um, deep dive, but just in a quick peruse, there, there's close to a, probably over a hundred verse, verses in scripture related to just asking. And Jesus talks about asking a lot. Let me just give you one. Matthew 7, we back up a little bit from Matthew 14, go back to Matthew 7, 7 to 11. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. Um, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You know what I found as being a father? That um, particularly my, my, my little ones, um, when they ask me for things, I'm give, my response is giving them a point of reference for what I would be open to and what I wouldn't. So, so they're, they're, they're starting to discern a little bit around, like, what they can ask for, what would be amenable. So, so they learn how to adjust their asking depending on what they know I would be willing to give them. And so when we, when we read this about um, asking and receiving and seeking, like, it, it's not a free-for-all because we know as parents, we're not going to give our kids stuff that's not good for them, stuff they're not ready for, or if there's poor motivation, Right? And so when we, when we develop this relationship with God we, and, we, and we ask, we, we, we understand his desire. We understand how to seek him better. And then, you know, we ask sometimes we don't get the things we want. Well, Jesus' his brother tells us why. James 4, 3, he says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. Or you spend it on your passions. That's that motivation piece right there. But there's one other thing I want to emphasize here before we bring this to a close. Jesus really desires 
I want us to hear this part. Jesus desires for us to get out of our boats. And you know what the boats represent? The comfortable places in our lives. That, that's what he ultimately desires. He ultimately desires for us to just get out of the church attendance boat. Well, we just, we, just show, we just showing up. That's not really producing much in our lives if we really want to be honest. He wants us to get out of the, 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 the boat where we just hang with our friends who think like us, who vote like us, who live like us. That's comfortable. He wants us to get out of the boat of just pursuing material possessions that always overpromise and underdeliver. Always. And Jesus, this is what he promises us. If we, if we take a small step towards him, if we begin to ask him, this, this is what he promises us. He promises us regularly, over and over and over again, the abundant life. He promises us joy. He promises us peace. Get this, in the midst of sufferings, not the absence of, because he said in this life you will suffer. But he promises us peace in the midst of. He makes promises to us if we take this step. And listen, Jesus, I mean, yo, y- y'all know people who just, they just be talking, man. They just talk out the side of their neck, and they, they really ain't about it, you know? Like, go back and check the scriptures. This is, Jesus is saying this because he was always hanging with people nobody else would hang with. He was always being accused of, like, yo, man, like, why is he eating with these people? Do he not know, like, of their reputation? This is why he would talk to women in public, which you were not supposed to do. But he's elevating women. This is why he would touch lepers, people that nobody else would touch. Because he is modeling for us a life of radical disruption against the emptiness of the world. Because the comfort in our lives it, it is producing emptiness, and God desires more for us. And the last thing I'll say that Jesus said is, he said, listen, everything you see me do, I'm doing what the Father does. I'm taking my cue from my Father in heaven. And so everything that we do, we're taking a cue from somewhere. Everybody is being discipled. To be a discipler, I'm sorry, to be a disciple means to be a, a follower. So, so everyone is following something or someone. So the examination for us is who or where or how are we taking our cues when we take the steps towards whatever it is we're taking our steps towards. Let me land the plane for us like this. April 16th, 1963. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously penned what we call letters from a Birmingham jail. Fascinating um, moment in time because literally this penning of this letter is on like toilet paper and just scrap pieces of paper. And, And the audience that he is writing to is white clergy and what he called uh, the white moderate, who were a group of people that weren't openly hostile. They, they, they weren't um, necessarily actively working um, to uh, promote segregation, but they weren't actively working to shut it down. And here is the thing. They wanted transformation without tension. And Dr. King said, actually, you're the biggest threat to transformation because you're prioritizing comfort and convenience and not understanding that, that, that this tension that you're trying to prevent is actually what you need to step into. And he says, we must understand as we take our cue from the early church, as he's writing to them, that, that they always found themselves in these contentious situations because that's what it means to follow Jesus, to be a disciple. This is what it means. Because communion with Jesus leads us down dangerous paths. And it causes us to deny our comfort. 
So when we ask according to his will for us, a lot of times we don't like to do that because we already know, you know, it's, 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 it's causing us to take a step in a direction that we don't want to go. So we pray with disclaimers. You know, it's like, Lord, I will if, you know, or God, can you, I feel you, you calling me and directing me in this way. So, so, so if, if this or if that, like, like we're, it, it's just not open for God to do what he's calling us to do because it, it challenges our comfort. But, but he wants, here's the thing, he wants us to ask him and, and he wants us to come closer to him. And here's the amazing thing about this, and, and I, I, I thought about this, when we're born, right, all of us, when we're born, we automatically get God's permissive will. When we're born again, as Jesus talks about, we get power to do his will. So, so think about this, a, a natural, in the natural birth, right, there, there's, there's permission that we get. We get the power to choose. We, we, can, we can decide whatever we want to decide. When God created um, the first humans, Adam and Eve, he, he gave them the power to choose. That was his permissive will. But when we experience a rebirth in Christ, we now receive the power to do his will, the power to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine. We need to stop praying that and saying that if we're not pursuing God. Because that's where it comes from. And what we see here is in, in, in Peter's life, in this, this passage that we read, is that extraordinary power awaits us when we ask. And by the way, Peter is having a conversation with Jesus, and he's asking, you know what that's called? Prayer. That's what that's called. Communication with God. And so here's my encouragement to you as we, as we close. For 2023 and, and beyond, bring your request to God. That's, that's how we should prioritize. Bring them. And he asked for us to bring them. But then have a rhythm of prayer, a rhythm of asking, a rhythm of seeking. That's persistence. And then remember his promises and past victories because that's going to give us fuel to keep going and to stay patient while we wait. And we'll constantly find ourselves in this cycle over and over again. And the reason why this is important is because, particularly this part about remembering his promises and past victories, is because the number one thing that we battle against is doubt and unbelief. Doubt and unbelief is always crouching at our door. At our highest moments, at the highest peaks, at some point, there's some doubt and there's some unbelief crouching at our door, waiting. And it happened even right in this story. Right after Peter walks on the water in verse 30, it says that he shifted his focus to the wind. And when he did that, it says he was afraid and he began to sink. He began to sink. But then verse 31, Jesus says, Peter, I'm here. Why did you doubt? And I'm encouraged by that because even when we doubt, God is still able to deliver. So this is not about being perfect. It's not about making mistakes. It's going to happen. We're going to fall short. But even in that, God is able to deliver us. So I'm going to leave you with these two questions for us to ponder. What boat are you in that you feel compelled to get out of today? Some of us are very clear about what that boat is. Some of us might be a little foggy. So that might be what we need to ask is, God, what, what is the boat? Because the expectation is 
God wants us to, to get out of that boat and move closer to him. And, and then secondly, are you willing to take a small step of asking, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Because I can imagine every single person in this room came into 2023 saying, I want this year to be different. I want it to be better. I want to experience more. I'm sure that's the case. And I also know that we know that if we don't do anything and we try to preserve and stay comfortable, it won't happen. So I'm going to ask everyone to just, just bow your hands and our worship team is going to come and just lead us in a time of worship. And I'm going to ask a couple of our prayer team members to be available as well. In case you want someone to pray with you, you want someone speak over you and I don't want you to be intimidated by that you know the scriptures tell us that we should bring our burdens to one another you know why he tells us not so people can be in our business so that we can help carry one another's burdens and I just believe that there's someone, maybe a few, here in this room, you know specifically that this week, God is asking you to get out this boat. This week. And so maybe the prayer is, God, give me the strength to take the step. Let's just bow our heads. God, I just thank you so much for just this opportunity. I thank you for how you are compelling us and the one small step is to just ask you. Not ask according to you.